Hello, we are in the 11th week of our course elements of literature and creative communication. Uh, two more weeks for the completion of the course and uh, if you just uh, you know look back at the range of uh, uh, subjects we have covered and the range of topics we have discussed, learnt, debated. Well, you would be quite surprised because uh, in a course that spans 12 weeks, uh, uh, we have covered uh, a wide gamut of uh, topics, you know literary topics. So, uh, you can proudly say if you have uh, sincerely attended all the classes and uh, you know you have participated in the assignments and all that, you can proudly say that uh, you have learnt uh, uh, quite many things uh, in literature and more than that please remember we have uh, highlighted this right in the very beginning. Literature is more about developing sensibility, in fact uh, it, it is more than knowledge production, it is about uh, you know how to respond to the society around right. Therefore, automatically our uh, sensory organs they will have uh, increased their potential you know. Uh, if not uh, literally at least metaphorically our sensibilities will have uh, grown by leaps and bounds and you know uh, our sensitivity quotient to respond to society around will have automatically you know attuned to its uh, best uh, uh, capabilities something like this. Last week we discussed uh, drama, in fact we introduced drama, discussed it in detail in terms of uh, you know structures, elements, techniques used, types and all that. So, in this week uh, uh, we are beginning with Aristotle and the dramatic art. In other words, uh, this week would uh, you know focus on discussing western drama, especially in terms of its origin and various uh, theories concerning western drama. So, we are beginning uh, this week with a discussion of Aristotle because as uh, you know every uh, student of literature who has had uh, you know some exposure to uh, western uh, theatre in general and the concept of tragedy in particular would know. Aristotle is uh, you know an invariable and uh, you know you cannot do away with Aristotle when it comes to discussing drama. You know you can do away with anybody uh, but Aristotle because you know Aristotle uh, the kind of uh, the western tradition of drama that we have now which has an history of uh, about 2500 years. It has uh, you know its foundations in uh, you know Aristotle's contribution especially in the in, in its theoretical foundations you find Aristotle's contribution you know to a very significant extent that is the reason why we have to begin we have to willingly we have to begin uh, uh, our discussion of uh, you know theory of uh, uh, tragedy, theory of drama, uh, theory of theatre and all that with Aristotle. And Aristotle is somebody that you might have heard in various contexts. In fact, uh, for the uninitiated or you know Aristotle happens to be the teacher of uh, the, uh, Alexander the Great, at least in that context we would have heard uh, Aristotle's name. He was uh, the teacher of uh, the great Alexander who conquered many parts of uh, the world and all that you know. But uh, Aristotle's significance uh, especially in the western intellectual traditions, western epistemological traditions is, is remarkable. In fact, uh, you know it is much more than what we can fathom in our limited understandings because Aristotle was in uh, the true sense of the term versatile, you know he was in the true sense of the term a versatile or a multifaceted genius because today various branches of uh, natural sciences, different branches of uh, you know philosophical sciences consider Aristotle as the founding figure. In fact, many of them even go to the extent of calling him as the father of physics, father of biology. You heard me right, you know his uh, contribution to physics, biology, the list of subjects that I mentioned in the second point you know 
they are not random uh, subjects, he had a mastery over all of them, not familiarity, but mastery over all of them, because he has authored foundational works in these areas, zoology, metaphysics, logic, ethics, aesthetics, poetry, theater, music, rhetoric, linguistics, economics, meteorology, geology, psychology. Now, look at this including government and administration. He was a polymath. He was in the true sense of the term, you know, the master. In fact, the Middle Eastern cultures consider him as the first teacher the first teacher Adi Guru, in fact what we call in the Indian context Adi Guru, you know Aristotle is in the western context, especially in the middle eastern context the first teacher. <coughs> Considering his contribution to all these uh, different uh, branches of uh, knowledge, Dante a 14th century uh, poet, Italian poet of course, you know Dante in the context of the divine comedy. In fact, uh, divine comedy is uh, one of the invaluable pieces of literature written during the middle ages, you know 14th century Italian poet. Dante considers Aristotle as the master of those who know, you know like the master of the master, something like this. That is the reason why, in fact, uh, he, he is a part of the great, uh, you know, uh, philosophical tradition, uh, uh, western philosophy begins with an active discussion of Socrates, right? Socrates and from Socrates you have Plato who is a direct pupil of Socrates and Aristotle is a direct pupil student of Plato. Therefore, they are called the triumvirate, the trimurti of uh, western philosophy, you know. Uh, so, they, they are the ones who, 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 who uh, you know, who prepare the ground for western philosophy to flourish. And Aristotle was such kind of a genius that, you know, he, he I mean, you know, in his works you find a complex synthesis of uh, various epistemes, various schools of philosophies as, as, as such, you know. And uh, historians have attributed more than 200 books in you know natural sciences, philosophy, logic, ethics, metaphysics and all that. Unfortunately, uh, we have uh, so far you know 30 of his works have survived you know that is all. Whereas, we find references to his works uh, in some of them or in some of the works written by his uh, you know his peers and his students and all that. Uh, now, imagine what kind of a scholar this guy must be you know and here what I have is a uh, 11th century probably painting of Aristotle, uh, an oil painting, 11th century painting of uh, Aristotle, a great guy. And why do we discuss such a genius in our class on drama and theatre? Because our first, our first very work of you know theoretical work on uh, you know on drama, western drama begins with him, it is called poetics. Now, remember uh, when uh, Aristotle was writing, uh, there was not much of a distinction between poetry and drama, you know that because even drama, uh, you know, had, uh, you know, much, I mean, the most part of the drama was filled with poetry. Therefore, his observations hold good for poetry as well, but it is a, a distinct theoretical book, you know, uh, that deals with uh, theories of tragedy, comedy, the very nature of art in general and all that, poetics that is the work, that is the reason why we discuss Aristotle and invoke his presence. So, if you are really interested to know, you can please uh, uh, take a look at uh, Aristotle's works and contributions in various areas, especially today his works are invaluable in the study of logic, you have especially in the study of uh, ethics, uh, the contemporary corporate world uh, you know makes use of Nicomachean ethics, that is his remarkable work. So, you can take a look at some of his works. Now, the distinct contribution of Aristotle is in the contribution in, in his uh, different uh, concept of uh, you know uh, treating literature or poetry or as drama, because until that point of time people uh, looked at uh, uh, drama or theatre or performing arts from a kind of you know spiritual ground. It was a part of remember, uh, it was part of a, you know religious background, right. Uh, like poetry, uh, 
drama too has its background in various religious rituals. Maybe in the subsequent classes, we, when, while discussing origins of drama, we can touch upon that. Whereas for the first time, he reimagined, he recalibrated, you know, the lens of drama and performing arts and considered it as, you know, from a, from a scientific approach, considered it as a, as a, a, I mean, in a scientific approach. That's why, you know, we call, in fact, look at the term techne, it's a, the, we, I mean, you and I keep using word like technology very frequently, right? And we use it as a kind of a, you know, polar opposite of arts and performing arts and things like that. But you'd be surprised to know that techne or technology has a, a, a combination of roots, you know, techne and uh, logi. You know, techne means actually art, it means skill. Therefore, technology traditionally should be a systematic study of, uh, you know, art or skill. But today, technology means something drastically opposite, right? Yeah, but it has it. So, techne in that sense, it has the connotation of making or doing also. That is why technology in that sense, it has many meanings, you know. So, technology is study of making, especially, you know, uh, uh, application of sciences today come to be called technology and all that. Uh, Aristotle, we have already identified him as a scientist. He was a natural scientist. In fact, uh, he also has a, you know, some significant discussion on uh, uh, dentistry as well, you would be surprised that. Of course, uh, his theory was later disproved, another matter, but uh, you know, he had uh, 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 some contributions in dentistry too, okay. So, he had a scientific approach, you know, uh, therefore, he looked at even uh, plays, drama also from that, that particular approach. Therefore, while uh, his predecessors such as, you know, Sophocles, Euripides and, uh, you know, Aristophanes, they were his predecessors were busy making plays, were busy making drama. He studied the structures underlying the drama. He studied, so in, this, in that sense, we have the first structuralist in him. We study structuralism when, you know, 1950s, 60s and all that. Whereas, we find the first structuralist in Aristotle because, you know, he studied the underlying structure, I mean, behind uh, an artistic enterprise called drama and came out with various elements constituting drama, various types of drama and, you know, what, what is significant in drama. So, very thorough and a systematic approach. That is the reason why we begin with uh, Aristotle and especially his uh, uh, important work, uh, you know, called uh, Poetics. Now, uh, yeah, in fact, uh, we have several translations of uh, this particular work available. Penguin Classics is one of the most popular ones. If you are interested in uh, reading uh, Poetics, out of curiosity, you know, at least a couple of pages, you can take a look at the Penguin Classics. Now, according to Aristotle, whether it is, uh, you know, the, I mean, this particular observation, remember, you know, uh, is relevant to the Greek drama that was played until his time. But uh, his influence and the influence of Greek drama spread much beyond the classical Hellenistic age. In fact, until, let us say, the Elizabethan period, because Elizabethan period developed its own distinct dramatic sensibility. But that too has its foundations or it borrows some of its features from this Greek tradition of drama. And that is the reason why these elements of drama are almost, they hold good even to this day. Even to this day, every any student of drama, any student of, uh, you know, uh, uh, theatre, they will have to necessarily go through Aristotle's uh, elements of drama. So, according to him, uh, either a tragedy or a comedy or any drama, you know, should have six distinct elements. We must have discussed this in the very beginning of the classes in a very tangential way. So, today we are going to discuss it in a little more detailed manner, all right. So, plot, character, theme, and remember, it is a, a translation from the Greek, therefore, a couple of translators call it theme and some someone else might as well call it thought. Similarly, for dialogue and diction, then you have music or it can also be called song, then you have spectacle. These are di different elements of uh, drama and 
to a certain extent this uh, you know this the order in which it is written is also significant because for Aristotle plot I mean plot occupied uh, you know a primary position of significance in, in drama you know. So, therefore, let us uh, study that in a systematic way. The word in Greek for plot is mythos you know mythos the same root word for mythology and all that mythos. According to Aristotle, uh, plot occupied it is like a, it occupied the crown of glory in, a, in, in drama if anything occupied a crown of glory then it is automatically plot because he seemed to have said that the plot is the first principle as it were it is the soul of a tragedy. Its true character is important, but it holds a secondary position and of course, that is why after plot you have character you know plot therefore, he considers plot the soul of tragedy when he said tragedy of course, all dramatic because until that point of time uh, you know uh, tragedy was a predominant uh, type of drama uh, comedy was a later invention we identified that right because at least for a first uh, you know uh, uh, a couple of hundred years uh, tragedy uh, was the only drama that was getting played and uh, later of course, with Aristophanes uh, uh, comedy was introduced we are going to discuss that in the subsequent classes. Now, for him plot is very very important because as we discussed in the class on fiction you know plot is a sequence of events that are connected. So, not just in terms of chronological events, but also in terms of cause and effect why did something happen, what are the reasons behind this and why did this happen and what is the result of this like this cause and effect. So, plot is related to that a sequence of events and they are interconnected and in fact, it is like a, it is like you know an engine that propels a, a, a motor vehicle you know. So, you a plot if you can metaphorically say it is the engine that pushes the vehicle ahead. So, if uh, drama is a vehicle then plot is its engine something like that. Therefore, he said that uh, a plot should have a unified whole in fact, a plot is subdivided into act 1, act 2, act 3 and all that. So, they are interconnected you know you cannot have some random uh, you know acts inserted together. So, there must be a kind of a unity it must he later used the word unity of action we are going to discuss it uh, in the subsequent slides. But a plot should have a unified artistic component driven to achieve a desired effect because if the playwright intends certain effect to be created on the audience your plot should aid you in that you know that is why it should have a neat beginning, a middle and an end. Of course, later Freytag uh, develops based on the ideas proposed by Aristotle Freytag develops it as you know exposition rising action remember that you know climax falling action donumon that structure. So, Aristotle's influence can be found there. So, in this book he makes use of uh, certain very important concepts you know called hamartia, hubris, peripetia, donumon, uh, you know anagnosis, catharsis these are the various technical terms let us take a quick look at them. Uh, he says that the plot has to move through certain some of these features in fact, hamartia that is a Greek word for let us uh, it has been roughly translated as a kind of a tragic flaw because in a character especially in a tragic character there must be something wrong in that character that is why you know whatever the character does. Uh, they do not succeed in that either a fatalistic uh, error or a tragic flaw in the in, in them something like that. So, that is hamartia. So, the plot moves from the tragic flaw through peripetia because you know because of the flaw things that are going smoothly you know there is a kind of a sudden reversal things begin uh, you know going sore they are not happening properly there is a sudden reversal that reversal of fortune can be called peripetia that is the term he uses for that. And then because of this the character undergoes a, an introspection mode you know why is this happening to me what might be the reason. So, then the character realizes something must be wrong with them right that is called a, a recognition you know a proper recognition or a revelation or a recognition uh, they, they realize the reason behind it. 
However, it is too late by the time they realize the reason behind it, it is too, too late and it results in tragedy and that is when catastrophe you know uh, takes place you know something like this or uh, this is called uh, catharsis you know it, it, it leads to <coughs> catharsis. So, that is something that he uses and uh, Aristotle believed again he thought that you know there are uh, two types of plots one is a simple plot which need not go through all these movements the other is of course a complex plot and he believed that uh, an ideal tragedy you know in its uh, full glory should necessarily have a complex plot so this is his understanding of plot you know a plot should have a neat beginning middle and an end all the you know five elements and all of them and things like that okay now let us go to see the second uh, uh, element character in Greek it is called ethos. Character occupies the second uh, you know in, in a pedestal character occupies the second position. So, uh, when we say character generally it refers to the protagonist here not so much about the other characters. So, he says that character is that which reveals moral purpose you know because it is through the character that the uh, action takes place therefore you know he says that character is that which reveals moral purpose showing what kind of things happen here whether a person chooses it or avoids it and things like that well we have already identified aristotle giving uh, you know primacy to plot over character why does he do that he says that uh, character might give us quality in terms of characteristic traits it may help us realize the qualities of uh, uh, individuals humanity whereas it is in our actions because it is in what we do that uh, whether we are happy or unhappy is decided based on what we do therefore you know what we do happens because of the plot right uh, so that was his understanding it's true that of course there are a lot of complications to that you can theoretically disagree with him because you know uh, uh, based on what you do your character also develops right because you cannot distinguish your character from the characteristic trait and what you do you know you cannot distinguish like that but for Aristotle that was a, an important distinction therefore he prioritized plot over character that is what he said you know. And uh, again in there are various types of characters found in drama of course we have discussed uh, round character flat character protagonist antagonist and all that. And uh, for Aristotle believe that in order for a, an, a protagonist in a tragedy to be effective the protagonist should not be too much of an ideal character not also a character who is morally uh, you know depraved somebody who balances between the good and bad because if the person is too noble too good the audience would not believe would not identify you know themselves with this character right oh he is godlike he is not like us why should we watch it and if the character if the protagonist is uh, you know too too much morally depraved you know is too bad then the character i mean the audience lose respect for that therefore he believed that uh, a character has to be you know of a, a mixed balanced background something like this so this was uh, uh, and once when you have that kind of a balanced uh, protagonist uh, that kind of a balanced protagonist is capable of arousing in the audience emotions of pity and fear in fact they are the predominant emotions uh, you know through pathos he uses the term called pathos through pathos uh, especially using pity and fear uh, an element of catharsis is achieved a purgation of our own feelings you know when we watch these elements these uh, you know feelings in their full fledged way then we come across uh, when we come across those elements those emotions in us they get purged something like that that was Aristotle's belief character ethos. From character let us go to theme or thought you know in Greek uh, it is Dionia. This is the third essential element of drama according to Aristotle because you know this is something that binds an entire play together it is the common thread that binds the whole play. So, imagine it like if it is a you know a necklace of pearls. So, this is the thread that holds all the pearls otherwise in the absence of it you know like uh, you know how precious the pearls are well if they are scattered they are of no use right. So, in order to hold noble characters extraordinary characters extraordinary plot and all that you need to have a solid uh, theme or a thought 
you know. So, and Dionia also has a very interesting meaning. In fact, it also refers in, in, in logic, it refers to a cognitive process that is useful for discursive thinking or that is a result of a dis discursive thinking that can be things like that. So, depending on the thought or the theme, you can mold various characters, you can mold uh, various situations, you can mold a setting. So, everything depends on it, you know it is like an invisible thread that connects everything in the play, something like this. Okay? Now, from theme, let us go and uh, you know take a quick look at uh, diction. Uh, it can also be construed as language again how you translate it right in Greek of course, the word he uses is lexis. Lexis refers to the choice of words you know the choice of diction, the choice of you know language, phrases you use employed by characters, what kind of language the characters employ when they are conversing with the fellow characters especially the language employed by the protagonist and things like this. Right. So, this is a very significant element because remember uh, in order for us to know what the character does of course, it is not a pantomime remember it is not a mime. So, where there is no script all that we have to understand is through the facial expressions and the body movement in a proper full fledged uh, drama dialogues play an important role. Therefore, what the choice of language that the playwright does or the director you know keeps in mind that becomes very very important the actors. Uh, the characters uh, language you know. Uh, and then remember at earlier you know it was a, a, a combination of uh, verse and prose right. It was a kind of a combination of uh, prose and verse even in, in uh, the Indian context we say champu that is a distinct uh, uh, a combination of uh, you know poetry and uh, prose even in the Indian context right. Champu Kavya, when we say Champu Kavya in Sanskrit poetics, what we, mean, what we mean is actually a combination of poetry and prose. So, similarly he says that you know if you use too much of poetry, then what happens? Of course, poetry adds an elevated beauty, but if the audience does not understand the elevated use of language well it may disorient the audience. On the other hand, if you use too much of prose, it may lack elegance to it. Therefore, an ideal drama is something that has you know that balances between regular speech you know colloquial speech or prose that adds clarity to the dialogue and poetic speech you know that lends the quality of beauty you know. So, something like this about diction. From here, let us go and uh, uh, see one more component this is uh, music you know. Remember uh, for Aristotle music was not a, an, a kind of you know it was a separable component from drama. Well, he believed that even without music drama would do well, but uh, you need to uh, it is like ornamentation. Now, think of it you know a person can survive even without uh, you know all those uh, you know beautification jewels and all that right. So, something like that. So, he believed music you know lent uh, an ornamentative uh, quality to the drama, but of course, there were many playwrights who did not agree with that because today music is you have a musical drama we discussed uh, you know an opera. An opera is a musical drama where music is the lifeblood of uh, you know drama of course, even in a regular theatre music plays a very very important role either in setting the mood of the character or in setting the mood of the audience or even as a, a very interesting and, a, and an enriching prop you know a, a stage prop music is employed. But for Aristotle it was not a very very important thing. So, he believed that uh, it depicts it is a kind of an accompanying element in order to depict the inner turmoil of a character or the internal climate of a character, internal climate. And uh, remember we have the origins of drama in music chorus because we say that you know out the, the so called concept of Greek drama or the western drama it came out of chorus and chorus basically sang everything right. So, therefore, uh, chorus played when we say music we are basically referring to what the chorus does you know chorus basically sings 
and it interprets we identified various uh, functions of a chorus. So, the uh, when it comes to chorus basically it operates through music you know something like this. So, uh, and of course, pathetic fallacy we discussed pathetic fallacy right of course, you can also use uh, in order to uh, portray the internal uh, conflicts the internal joys you can make use of music. But in the ancient times of course, music played a very very important role, but maybe by the time Aristotle began writing it he is a he is a theorist remember he is not a practitioner of drama because uh, you know. Uh, so, you can say that poetics is basically a product of his inductive logic. What is inductive logic? Based on deductions, right? Based on his observations of the plays of Aeschylus, uh, uh, Euripides, uh, and Sophocles, Aristophanes, he must have deduced a play must be like this, a play must be like this. Uh, nevertheless, it is a significant work, it is the first theoretical work. Okay? And finally, we have a spectacle, the sixth uh, element. Okay. This is again a spectacle, he considered spectacle uh, slightly important because spectacle in, in you know we have the Greek word opsis which means you know anything that the audience sees. It is an, a visual apparatus, it is the visual apparatus of drama because when a drama is presented remember if when we say performing arts it is meant to be seen, heard and appreciated. So, what are those elements that the audience sees? right from costumes to scenery to facial expressions everything is part of spectacle spectacle right everything is part of spectacle except maybe thought and uh, plot and all that in order for that to unfold properly it has to be presented in a proper way so therefore the movement of the actors uh, and uh, the lighting area the setting area the curtains the uh, rich scenery backgrounds that they use all of them form Spect spectacle for uh, you know in the Greek context and for Aristotle. Let us say for and 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 modern playwrights make a very uh, a beautiful experimentation using spectacle. Now, imagine uh, Hamlet you know I, I discussed you know Hamlet was uh, performed let us say on stage arena theatre properly. Now, Hamlet is being performed uh, let us say for instance on a lakeside. Hamlet is being performed in a garden setting with lights, without lights. So, the effect varies significantly. Therefore, in the hands of uh, uh, an able director, in the hands of an able dramatist, you know spectacle can take as significant a position as drama. In fact, uh, uh, especially in the celluloid uh, medium today spect spectacle is all right, because what we see uh, determines the content because ultimately content how do we know the content unless we see it therefore seeing the optic you know see so therefore spectacle is related to the optic of the drama and everything is related to the optic right that's why you we use the term optic so these are uh, you know though for aristotle it's the least significant element of tragedy in the hands of contemporary playwrights in the hands of contemporary directors and dramatists spectacle comes to occupy a very important significance okay so uh, these are various uh, you know or six distinct elements of drama that uh, aristotle highlights in his uh, important work poetics okay so, in the next class probably we can uh, uh, discuss some other interesting concepts and things like that. Okay? Until then take care, bye bye.